The Spartan Nationals are coming to Jacksonville, Florida, April 8th through the 10th. Wrestle freestyle, folk style, Greco, and Beach at the Spartan Nationals. Register now at SpartanCombat.com. That's SpartanCombat.com. Attitude is more important than facts. Your attitude is more important than your circumstances. The way that you perceive things is much more important than how they actually are. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, I spent wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. This is yours truly, Ryan Warner, coming to you from Chicago IL here in Illinois. It's state tournament week. The sectionals were this weekend, and all of the lucky state qualifiers will be heading down to Assembly Hall this Thursday. Illinois will always hold a special place in my heart. So good luck to you this weekend. Our guest today, folks, is Nick Sigelski. He was a high school All-State wrestler out in Rochester, New York, home of the great Yanni D. He went to USC on a full scholarship, and when he got there, realized just how much he missed wrestling. He started a wrestling club at USC. They compete in the NCWA. He's been a coach for Beat the Streets LA, and now Nick hosts a very successful podcast called 30 Minutes to President's Club. It's all about sales, and everyone knows how much of a fan I am of outside sales, tech sales, and so this one combines wrestling with a little bit of business acumen, and I really appreciate Nick for coming on the show. Fan of the week goes to Zach Mansfield, one of the foremost collectors of IKWF merchandise that I've ever seen. Zach, thanks so much for listening and for reaching out. I greatly appreciate it. This episode is presented by Spartan Combat. Register now for the Spartan Nationals at SpartanCombat.com. If you love this podcast, and I know you do, please support our sponsors. It would mean the world to me if you went to SpartanCombat.com and checked out their national tournament taking place this April 8th through the 10th, the year of our Lord, 2022. Now that's it, folks. Let's give it up for the great and powerful Nick Zagelski. Nick Sagelski, Pride of Rochester. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, thanks for having me on, Ryan. I'm really excited for this one. Man, we have so many parallels, sales, wrestling, podcast host. I wanted to start, though, with uh, you went to USC on a full academic scholarship, which, which that's probably a story for another day. You get there, beautiful Southern California, and you're having a little bit of an identity crisis because they don't have wrestling. Talk us through that. So wrestling was my life when I was in middle school and high school, right? I went to like my, probably like the, the best story of it is I went to the Jay Robinson 28 day camp when I was in between my ninth and 10th grade year. And that was the happiest 28 day, day period of my life. Like up until I, I got off to college. Right. And I earned the black hat award out there, which is like a really, really prestigious award. Like it's for the hardest work. Ever. It was my complete life. Like total blinders on every single night I wrote in a journal. Like I had a training journal. I was obsessed with the sport of wrestling, which is a really, really good thing, but I wasn't obsessed with like the uh, rejuvenation, like sharpen the saw side of things. And so by the time I got to my senior year of high school and I grew up in Western New York, where I looked at the weather, it's eight degrees there right now. And it's 86 <laughs> right here in, in LA. I go out, I fly out to Southern California. I'm interviewing for this scholarship. So they're sort of whining and dining you, right? There's palm trees. It's really, really amazing. It's LA, which is like the media capital of the world. And 
I'm like, wow, okay, I'm going to like, I'm done wrestling. I'm going to move on to the next phase of my life. And I'm going to treat like my academics and my career. Like I did wrestling. I'm going to take it so seriously. So I get to campus my freshman year. I love it. It's amazing. I'm wandering around really, really fun. Everything about the school is great, except I didn't realize how much my identity, as you said, was tied in with the sport of wrestling. And there's a whole, I think there's problems when you identify with the sport, even if you're a really high level competitor, like you should, in my opinion, you should be taking it really, really seriously, the sport. But the second that that is who you are, things that are outside of your control are going to knock you off, of course. And if you let the sport be who you are, as opposed to like, I don't know, being principle based, you run into trouble. Anyways, I'm at campus and I'm like, what have I done? And so I call my high school wrestling coach. Um, <clears throat> I'm in tears, man. I'm crying. <laughs> what am I going to do? Like, I want to leave. I've been looking up, like, keep in mind, I've got a full academic scholarship to SC, which is like $60,000 a year. And I'm ready to go transfer to any community college that will take me just because I miss wrestling so badly. And so I call him and I'm like, what do I do? And he said two things that really, really stuck with me. The first, he said, Nick, if the biggest problem in your life is that you miss competing in the sport of wrestling, you really don't have it all that bad if you think about things relatively. The second thing he said was, my challenge to you is instead of like leaving SC and going somewhere else to wrestle, why don't you try to make a program happen at USC? And he said, and if you could make that happen, that would be even cooler than going and winning a national championship. And, um, you know, four, four years later, we had a fully thriving NCWA National Collegiate Wrestling Association program. I wrestled, um, gosh, probably 80 matches wearing a uh -huh. USC singlet against legitimate teams, right? We, the NCWA, we were talking earlier, it's sort of like the wild, wild west of, of wrestling in a way where you've got some very, very informal club teams where like they roll around once a week and they, you compete with them. And then you've got teams that they have full-time coaches. They've got big budgets. They're, they're training six or seven days a week. Um, and I got to compete against a whole range of teams like that. We wrestled a bunch of the junior colleges in Southern California. And so I am so glad that I had that experience. It was a very non-traditional college wrestling experience. I didn't have a coach every day saying, this is what your training plan needs to be. But something my high school coach always told me is you're going to always be your own best coach. Mm -hmm. And he said, the best skill you could learn from me is the skill of independence is what he called it, which is the idea of like, if you really want to make something happen, you'll find a way. If not, you'll find an excuse. And so my teammates and I, we would find like, we would find a random high school to go work out on on a Wednesday because we didn't have access to the gym at USC. And so, yeah, it was really an incredible college wrestling experience that has helped me so much more in my career than if I had gone and been told this is exactly how you need to operate, which it, it's a whole nother challenge going and wrestling <laughs> at like a real college program. But what I did, I think was right for me in my journey. Man, like you had the entrepreneur part of it. You had the, the grind, the, the competitive part of it. So it all kind of goes into one. So when you first got this idea, what's like step one to get a club program at USC? And had they ever had D1 wrestling in the past? USC never had a Division I program. They had had a club program on and off in years past. And so their, the biggest challenge would be finding a wrestling mat. And USC already had a wrestling mat. Keep in mind, it was probably purchased in 1972 and it was like <laughs> cracked all over and it was not in good shape, but there was a wrestling mat. And so how'd you find this out though? Like, who do you go to for something like that? So USC has um, a club sports department and I was lucky in that the year before I got to campus, there was a contingent of a couple other guys who had wrestled before. Some had come from community college. Like there was a contingent of wrestlers on campus who were like, it'd be kind of cool if we had a program and they had actually filed all the paperwork to start like to get USC's club wrestling team approved. And so I talked about earlier, like luck is sort of part of some of this, like you can't all attribute it to like your identity and yourself. And so I had the benefit of a team had already been approved to be on campus. Well, it's a lot of work, believe it or not going through all the paperwork. So all the guys who had done that work to get it chartered, we're like, that was way too much work. We're done now. Like I just wanted to wrestle. And so <laughs> I show up at, I show up at the first day of, they technically had a day, first day of club wrestling practice. And there's like eight guys there. I'm like, okay, this is kind of cool. We can make a team out of this. And then a week later I show up and no one is there. I, there was one day I showed up, 
I roll out all of the mats. I warm up. I've got my sweats on. I'm ready for this. 10 minutes go by, 20 minutes go by. Nobody's at practice. Oof. And so part of my, my job, like I almost played this hybrid role for four years of being like a wrestler competing captain of the team. And then also a like quasi coach in a way where mm-hmm. we had, we, we were able to recruit some coaches who were really, really wonderful, but the nature of how that club program operates is and keep in mind when I use the word club, what most people think is they think of like, all right, like, you know, you're drinking a beer at practice and rolling around. That's not the case. Like we took it really seriously. We trained hard. Um, you have to run a lot of the admin stuff. So I, I was like, competing in the duel, but I'm also the guy who's giving the check to the the referee at the end. And I'm the one figuring out our transportation to a tournament. So it was very much like a student run program in that way. Um, So how did you build it up from, from like the no, no people. And by the way, there's nothing more humbling than going to a practice and no one shows. You're just like questioning everything about yourself. You know Um, I used to coach a club way back, but so yet you have no one. And then like, how did you start building it up to the levels that, that were there when you graduated? Well, I want to go to something you just said a second ago. There's nothing more humbling than when you show up and nobody shows up. Think about how hard the sport of wrestling is already. Think about like it's deep in the season. You're a little bit burnt out. You're a little banged up. You've been cutting weight. You've got a competition coming up that maybe you're a little nervous for. Now take all that and throw on. You're not even sure if any of your teammates are going to show up at practice. And so (laughs) that, well, it does a really, really special thing. Because what happened to me now is anytime I go to a wrestling workout still, and there's a room of guys that I can get a good workout with, it just lights you up like no other, because it's almost this burden taken off of your shoulders where it's like, I was so used to showing up and being like, is there going to be anyone that I can actually work out with tonight? Like we we would, we would welcome anybody to the team, but you know, it's hard to get a great wrestling workout when you're working out with someone who it's their second time ever on a wrestling mat. Right. And so it taught me that, wow, if I show up in a room and there's people there, it it just gives me this jolt of adrenaline. And I know no matter what, it's going to be an awesome workout. And so I almost consider that sort of a superpower, What also happened because of that. Like we weren't able to get in the room every single day because USC, they don't have a lot of space. It's in downtown LA and there's 57 other club teams. So we would have to share the gym. Um, At one point we we created a truce with the ping pong club. I guess table tennis is what you're supposed to call it. And so we would share the gym. And I you created you not, a truce like, with the ping pong team. We made but... a truce with them. And so we would practice at the same time as them. They let us get in the gym when they, because they didn't need the whole gym. And so I'd be, I'd be wrestling our, our 184 pounder. I was 149, but he was like the one guy that I could get a workout with. And so my face is in the mat as I'm getting ridden out by this guy. He's laying on me and ping pong balls are hitting me in the face. And, <laughs> and, oh, and the mats are still wet because we couldn't get in to the gym on time. So anyways, um, to answer your question, there isn't a magic formula, just like there isn't a magic formula for becoming a great wrestler. The hard work that you do today adds up to the hard work that you do tomorrow, adds up to the hard work that you do the next day. And it's, it's a cumulative thing that builds. And so I made a couple rules for myself. I, and this has helped me a lot in my sales career, right? When somebody new walks into the wrestling room, and this is sort of anti what I think a lot of like normal college wrestling programs operate is like, I would stop what I was doing. Like you sort of need your head on a swivel. If somebody walked into the room and I didn't know who they were, like I would have to pull myself away from my hard drilling for a second and make sure that that person had a positive experience. The second that they walked into the wrestling room, even for experienced wrestlers, the first time you walk into a new wrestling room, there's sort of that feeling like you're a little bit nervous. You don't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. Is the coach going to be totally different than how I grew up? Will there be somebody for me to work out with? Like, what's the deal here? And my, my goal is if somebody walked in that room, I was going to go up, I was going to introduce myself. I was going to make sure that they felt good. I was going to get them with a partner that they could get a good workout with. And so my job was to very, very quickly connect with them, get them going, and then get back to my workout. And so that's not what you would do if you were wrestling at a, uh, you know, a formalized program. It's like, No, you just focus on your drilling, but that was not how we could operate. So I did that. You make sure that you stay on top of people. You invite them to like the team social events. You have to be a really, really great teammate. You can't be, you know, there's some wrestlers who have found a lot of success by being very, very selfish and like fixated on themselves and their own performance, which at the very, very highest level, you almost have to be. You Mm -hmm. can't do that when you're trying to build a program like that, because 
everybody wrestles for different reasons. And that is very, it gets no more, it's the most true, I think, at the club level. There's some people who, like, I wanted to be an NCWA national champion. That was my goal. I wanted to, like, get to the very, very highest level at the, uh, at the NCWA, which I didn't do. I lost in the finals my senior year. Um, there's other people who just, they want to be a part of a team. Mm-hmm. There's other people, they just, they just want to stay in shape. There's other people who they wrestled in sixth grade and, like, they're looking for a place to belong. And so they come back out. And so <clears throat> I think when you can accept that people wrestle for different reasons and connect with them and find a way to, like, get them to fit into that program. So the, there's no easy answer to your question. Yeah. Just every single day, like, it, and it's hard. Like I, I remember like getting changed in the locker room before practice thinking I might walk up there and there might be two people in that room and the mats need to be mopped. And I'm going to have to show up and almost artificially bring the, the energy of the room up. I'm sure you've been in rooms where like oh, the yeah. energy is really, really low. And that is like, that's the biggest, that's like the death curse to a, to a program. You have to walk in the room and bring the energy up and find a way to, to have there be a great workout. So, so how does the NCWA work? There's a, there's an actual national tournament. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Talk so us through N- that. So the NCWA, gosh, when I was competing, there were probably a hundred ish wow. club programs and they, they range. Like I said earlier, there's programs where it's extremely informal. They roll around on the mat once or twice a week and yeah, they might have a couple guys compete. There's also programs that are very, very formal. Uh, you and I were talking earlier. We competed against Cal Baptist for a number of years when they were transitioning into the NCAA. They, there's like a probationary period. So, yeah, my freshman year, in order to qualify for the NCWA Nationals, I had to beat a guy from Cal Baptist in the, the conference semifinals to make it. And so that was like a, an awesome match. And I won. And so I qualified. Um, we wrestled Liberty University, which, which used to be a division one program. And now like, they have a full-time coaching staff. They're a full, fully funded program. Those guys will wrestle and they'll compete in um, division one open tournaments. Like they're, they're a really tough program. There's a bunch of programs that, um, you know, are, are very, very formal and real. And so, yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's a national championships, which there's a wide, wide range of, of wrestling there. You will wrestle guys like, they're, they're not, they're not great wrestlers. Like it's their very first year wrestling. They came out for the club team. They didn't have a, a strong weight at the conference tournament and they made it out to the, the national championships. And it's a, you know, it's a 13 second pin credit to those guys for being on the map though, especially like to start wrestling in college. That's a mind blowing thing. Lunacy. Um, and then at the very, very top level, you'll get guys who they could be wrestling at, at any level. There, there have been guys who, so the like the air force and naval prep academies both compete in the ncwa or they did when i was there and those guys they do that for a year and then they go on and they wrestle division one and so i would say like the top there's the weights have 60 60 guys in them the top 20 all those guys are tough and so it's once you make it to the later rounds that it's really really tough so that's sort of how the ncwa operates all the teams are club programs on campus and then they still have to like there's a lot of stuff that you have to go through like minutia uh, from an administration perspective but that's what i got i was lucky enough to get to do when i was in college and so you guys were fundraising for uniforms singlets even travel to get out there right 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 yeah my freshman year usc gave us i think it was 175 dollars, which was enough for us to pay for <laughs> some some mat cleaner and a mop and yeah that was a big part of my job also was going out and trying to find find money um you know, we were lucky enough that we were able to network in and get some private private donors who helped us out. And we charged wrestlers every year, though. It, it cost 250 bucks to compete for the team, which uh, was tough. I mean, if somebody had a financial burden, we would find a way to get a scholarship or something for them. We would fundraise on top of that. But that was a big part of the job was figuring out how are we going to be able to pay for all of this stuff? So we you know, we found ways. We did a lot of local competitions. Luckily, U.S. Uh, California has a lot of junior college programs that we could compete with. Mm-hmm. And so that made it a little bit easier. Anytime we could do a thing where we didn't need a hotel, where it was like, OK, we're going up to Fresno, we'll wrestle and then we'll come right back. That was a win. Man, the fun you guys must have had driving to those and like the camaraderie of just like you're in it together must have been amazing. Well, I will tell you, Ryan, you talked about my podcasting history earlier. The two guys that I run my podcast with 
were USC wrestling teammates of mine. But my co-host was my training partner. And then the guy who does a lot of our backend um, business operations, he was also my training partner when, when Armand graduated because he was a year above me. So yeah, the guys, we, you know, we used to beat each other up on the wrestling mat and now we, we run a, like a decently successful business together. So yeah, yeah, I think that just, that speaks to the depth of the camaraderie we built. Oh man, it's just so exciting because that's the grassroots. You know, I mean, there's who doesn't love D1 wrestling and my brother wrestled D3. Uh, shout out to Tanner. And, uh, you know, a lot of my friends wrestle D3 because in Iowa, it's a huge D3 circuit. And that's even that gets some love, but you just don't hear as much about some of these club programs. And, you know, listen, everyone wants to see a, a D1 program at UCLA because they used, you know, the Schultz brothers wrestled there. It's like, mm-hmm. man, how, how did, how did, how did that happen? And, um, but just like the clubs out there, that's that's awesome to know that there's almost a hundred of them going just because they love the sport. Right. It's it's really, really special. It's anytime I'm in a wrestling room now, I, like I don't take it for granted anymore. I used to take it for granted, right? That in high school you show up, there's a practice there, you've got a full coaching staff, they've made a plan. You don't have to worry about how are we getting to the tournament. In high school, it was show up, work out hard, make sure you make weight and like compete to the best of your abilities. And I realized how much I took all that for granted. And now it's like, anytime I get to compete or be on the mat or be in a wrestling room where there's that energy, it's, it's the most gratifying thing. Wow. It's, that's just gravy. Just, Just being like, for me in high school and college, it was a win if we could get into a wrestling room and I'd be able to shadow wrestle for 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 an hour because at least there was a mat i'll tell you we had a guy on my team my senior year who was from kazakhstan like legitimately from kazakhstan um it's like if you know borat it's great wrestling country and he he hated borat he said this is disrespectful to my country he was mad (laughs) he was an awesome guy he had only ever wrestled um greco before because i guess that's what they trained and he and i would go and we would hand fight in the like the gym at USC and there weren't mats. So we would be like hand fighting in the corner and people are like, what, what the heck is wrong with these guys? But (laughs) that was a win for us. Me hand fighting with our 125 pounder from Kazakhstan. He didn't really speak English. So we're pounding each other in the head. He was a great wrestler. Um, Cause like the USC student population, it, you know, from what I hear from afar, it's very wealthy, affluent kids most of the time. Right. Or is that, is that a, not a fair statement? There, there's a subset of the population at USC that is like that. Um, I'm not lucky enough to come from that, right, that segment right. of the population. It's actually an incredibly diverse school. I, there's a ton of international students there. Really? Um, there is that, okay, you know, a lot of, they come up from Orange County, but for the most part, I found it to be a pretty diverse population. And so that I just didn't know, like, if, you know, if you see the two dudes hand fighting, that, that's like so foreign to what anyone would even imagine in the, uh, in the weight room, you know? So God, that is sweet. How, um, you know, how did you parlay that into some of the coaching you did? Cause I saw one of the coaching positions you had was in South central at Edison mm-hmm. middle school. Mm-hmm. What's that mm-hmm. scene like down there? That's, that's an interesting part of South central LA. Um, so when I was in college, I was lucky enough to get introduced to the folks from beat the streets, LA and shout out Andy Barth. Yeah. Yeah. Andy's awesome. Um, I'm really grateful for the relationship he and I have. I love wrestling. And there was a while where I was like, I don't know if this USC team is going to work out. And so worst case scenario, I thought, okay, let me go coach. And so I met Yaru Washington, who's the executive director of, of Beat the Streets LA. And I mean, he and I have known each other now for 10 years. Like I met him, right? It was like the second or third year of, of Beat the Streets LA being out there. And USC is located in South Central LA. It's not mm-hmm. in like, people think about USC and they think like it's going to be in Beverly Hills or something. It's not, it's, it's not in a great part of the city. But that was good for me because there were a ton of Beat the Streets LA programs there. And so- My sophomore year, I started coaching for, for beat the streets. And I did that all, all through, through, through college. I got to coach. There was one program that I coached. It was like a club program. Once the main middle school season ended beat the streets, LA primarily, at least back then it focused on middle school programs. And so I was coaching middle schoolers. And then there was a community program that was like 
a block off of Compton Ave. And so I would ride my bike there. I didn't, like I said, I, you know, I didn't come from the nice background. I had a bike, I didn't have a car. And so I would bike through South Central and get to practice every day. And that was awesome. That actually helped me a ton as a, as a competitor. Um, mostly cause like one of the things that I really, I think the air, I actually was, I, I became a much better wrestler in college than I was in high school. And part of the reason for that was the mental aspect of it, because I talked about identity earlier and in high school for me, when I was like, so, so fixated on my performance and my training, and that was all that I cared about winning and losing was like a matter of identity. And so I would get like, I don't want to say nervous, but like my mental side of things really did. I, I started leaning, like reading and listening to a lot of the wrestling mindset stuff in college. And that helped me compete at a much, much higher level. And then when you pass that on to wrestlers that you're coaching, it really deeply ingrains it in your brain. And so part of the reason that I was a much better competitor in college was I sort of let go of everything. It was like, okay, this isn't division one. This isn't division three. Like I'm just doing this because I enjoy wrestling now. This doesn't matter if I win or lose. The most important thing to me really was that I had a team around me and I had that camaraderie. Mm-hmm. I remember, so after I, I'll, I'll get back to the beat the street stuff in a second, but I lost in the, the national finals my senior year. I was, I, um, and I remember after the match going up and like all my teammates were waiting for me there that had qualified. We had six guys I think, who qualified my senior year and they're waiting up in the bleachers after and, they were like, how do you feel? Are you okay? Are you upset? And I was like, guys, like I wanted to win that match. It would have been meaningful to me, but that wasn't like the most meaningful thing to me. The most meaningful thing for me is I've got a team, like I've got a group of teammates who are here in the bleachers saying like, how do you feel? You just wrestled. And so that like, that's the most special thing. So anyways, beat the streets was really meaningful for me because I got to pass a lot of that stuff on. And there's something about like, when you get to say like, it's okay if you go out there and like, my big thing is if you wrestle to the best of your abilities and you go out trying to win the match, as opposed to trying to not lose the match, it's so much more fun. You let go of all of the pressure. And like my philosophy now is like, go out there and attack and try to create wrestling action. And part of that came from the, there was sort of limited competition um, when I was competing. And so like, if you're wrestling in 30 matches a year and you've got a wrestling room and a coach, it's like, okay, competitions competition you still take it seriously for me it was like wow i'm at a wrestling tournament and there's other teams like i don't want to be in one of those matches where you're locked in a collar tie for six minutes (laughs) and then there's about a minute of action and so my whole philosophy is like i want to go out there and it hurt me actually in in probably in the the national final match which i could talk about um i i just want to go out and create wrestling action because i want to wrestle for the full seven minutes not stand there for four and wrestle for three yeah well, and, I, and everyone knows this, you know, when you start teaching wrestling, you become a better wrestler. And right. unfortunately for a lot of people, they start teaching once their competitive years are done. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, they're like 25, 26. They're like, oh, man, I, I wish I could still wrestle. You know, you were still able to do that. And, um, you know, when you're going in those those schools like in Edison or like you know any of the Beat the Streets programs, um, was it something where they didn't have wrestling mats where they experienced wrestlers? Or is it first year wrestlers, totally novice and you're getting them? you know, first introduction to the sport. Yeah. So let's talk about beat the streets for a second. They did have a mat. It was in a closet that we had to like pull it out of a closet every day and then roll the mats, but all the kids were new. None of them had ever wrestled before. And a lot of those kids participating in the wrestling program was the first time that they participated in an after school program. There was a kid on one of my teams. He was a sixth or seventh grader at Edison. And being on that wrestling team was the difference between him, like going out and like, there was, there was a lot of gang activity in that area. And like, he was being, like I guess, recruited by a gang. Like he was telling me about how one of his like older buddies made him steal a license plate from a car. And like, they were stealing license plates. And so like, all right, you need to be a wrestling every day. Yeah. And so a lot of those kids, like they didn't, some of them don't have male role models at home. Um, some of them don't have role models in general, people who like the great thing about wrestling is it, it, it's like, it's such a positive impact. It's like, if you work hard, if you show up, like there's so many maxims or sayings from the sport of wrestling. I wrote a bunch down that I think about all, like I still think about them all the time. And so to have an adult role model being like, Hey, if you work hard at something, 
you can create something better for yourself. A lot of those kids didn't get that. And, um, I, you know, I dealt with some really tough things. Like I dealt with a lot of wrestlers who were going through their own identity crisis, crises, I suppose is the right word. And the thing that I realized after coaching, I think I coached for beat the streets for a total of five years is you're not a wrestling coach. You're a coach, you're a coach for their life. And it was much, much less about the wrestling and the individual specific moves. Yeah. None of those kids had experience on a wrestling map before the level of wrestling we were doing was not tremendously high. (laughs) Part of that being a first year coach, you have no idea what you're doing. Right. Right. Like, um, but the thing that mattered the most was that you show up and the kids know that you actually care. Like there's that saying, nobody cares how much, you know, until you know how much they care. Something my mom said to me actually, when I first started wrestling was, um, sometimes the best wrestling coaches are not, we're not the best wrestlers. And sometimes the best wrestlers don't make the best wrestling coaches because coaching is a skill and wrestling is a skill. And there's some overlap there, but it's not like a one-to-one overlap. So wrestling yeah, is one really... of the few sports that understands that. Don't you think like wrestling is like still kind of stuck in the mud on that? Like the great Bill Belichick, you know, I think he was like a division three player, you know, right. and, uh, but if you look at our best programs, it's all the best wrestlers. So I don't know if wrestling's unique or if wrestling just is uh, kind of tied them, you know, tied down to that philosophy of being a, a great wrestler to be a great coach. But I saw something interesting where it's like, if you could have the best D1 football coaches, like a Dabo Sweeney, mm-hmm. could he coach like a, an average Big Ten school? Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, I think he could because I don't right? think it's like is I don't think the skill is like as much of it as, as people think in college. I think it's a lot more of the, I mean, I don't know. You could tell me I'm wrong, but I'm just, I just think it's so interesting. Well, if you think about like what a head coach does, it's more like the big overarching like movement and motion of the season. And like a head football coach, they've got an offensive coordinator. They've got like a line coordinator even. And so Mm -hmm. if you think about applying that to a wrestling model, you, if you're like, if you're a great football coach, you know, okay, you're, it's like, I don't know if you watch Ted Lasso, like Ted Lasso is not the coach who's like showing the drills they need to do. Like you bring in people who have specific expertise. And so like, if I were the coach of a D1 program, you better believe I'm not the one who's going to be showing the technique. You bring in people who are much, much better than you at very specific things. And so you understand like the macro of what the program needs and you bring in people who are better than you to help manage all of that. Wrestling is a really interesting sport, though, because I don't know, like the very, very specific. I don't know. I agree with you. I'd be really curious to see a program experiment with that model and see what would happen, because I right. think they could be successful. It might be a complete train wreck, but I don't know. That's a well, the, fascinating point. The programs that struggle to me, it's like they struggle in like the fan support or the relevance. You know, there's some, I'm not going to name the names, but there's a couple yep. really historical programs right now that I'm thinking of that are just horrendous this year. And it just pains me to see that. But I look at that coach. I'm like, that's like a technique guy. That's like a right. drill guy. That's not like a CEO. That's not someone who's going to sit down with some of these big donors and get, you know, and, and, and get money in the program or go out to all the elementary cold call every elementary school and be like, Hey, kids come yeah. for free, come to the duel this Sunday, you know? That's what you got to have, I think, in wrestling, especially at, you know, these D1 programs where it's not Iowa. You know, you're never going to have that fan support, but you could have you could be like a Rob Cole and create something out of nothing at Cornell. And now they're a household name, you know, and right. um, brings well, us what back- you're talking about, Ryan, is something that so there's a book called The E-Myth. And the thesis of that book is if you are if you're the owner of a business, if you're the head coach of a wrestling program, you should be working on the program, not in the program. Your job is to be working on like making sure that the program as a whole and every facet of what's important for a successful wrestling program is humming along. And every single day of the week, being in a three-hour technique practice and you being the one leading the technique, actually it clouds you and you're down too low. You actually need to be up here looking at all of the elements is the marketing engine going right, right? Like the element, like if you're the head coach, you should not be the one, in my opinion, calling the elementary school, but you should know that that's something that needs to be done. And you should have one of your assistants doing that. Mm -hmm. And you should know as it is a general rule of thumb, like, all right, what's the technique curriculum and cadence for the season? And then have somebody else teach that. 
Mm-hmm. And then you should also know, okay, what do we need to do recruiting wise and fundraising right. wise? And you should be inserting yourself as the head coach of the program in the areas of the highest leverage. The same goes for any business. It goes for your podcast business. It goes for my business. You better believe like I'm not the one who edits my individual podcast, not but because I couldn't, but because by paying somebody else to edit my podcast, it allows me to create twice as much content. Mm-hmm. And there's a number of different ways that that fit in there. The biggest thing is you have to let go of that part. We talked about it earlier on the pre-show. You have to let go of your ego. And the ego is the enemy in that scenario. When your ego gets inserted in those things, it's like, I'm the head coach. I have to be the one teaching technique. <laughs> well, I don't trust my assistant to say the right thing when he calls the principal of the elementary school. Like, you might not say that out loud, but that's what our subconscious thinks. And that's part of the sort of double-edged sword about the sport of wrestling is When you're out on the map, the beauty of wrestling is it's all about you, right? There's no teammate to back you up. There's no timeout. You've all seen it on the wrestling shirts. But that's also like the the other edge of the sword. It's like it is all about you when you're competing as an athlete. And when you're running a business or running a program, it can't be. In fact, the mark of a really, really great head coach or CEO is like they could totally remove you from the organization and it would still keep humming along as normal. You Mm -hmm. should be able to, I'm not saying you do, as the head coach of a program, you could disappear for a month and the program would continue to operate as normal. Your job is to look for big strategic motions that need to be made, not be mired in the day-to-day tactical stuff. But that's extremely hard and much easier said than done. It is. And it's, uh, I'm going to call you after this to see like what you're outsourcing from a podcasting standpoint, because that's something too, you know, like all the the nuts and bolts of it, you know, there's so much of that. And, um, you know, being able to elevate yourself through that is, is really where you make some productivity gains. We've talked a little bit about wrestling. I want to talk a little bit about upstate New York, and then we'll move into sales. Oh, when I hear it. Rochester, I think of the great Yanni D over at Hilton Head. Was he coming up when you were through there? Are you? Are, what's what's the age difference there? Um, enough. So my senior year, Yanni was I want to say an eighth grader, and in the sectional finals, he beat my teammate in the sectional finals. So um, yeah, I mean we we trained at the same club program. I mean, he's been, he trained yeah. at a lot of different club programs, but there was one in downtown Rochester that was like in a warehouse and yeah, I would, I would, I would, he would be at the same practices as, as me. We like his team, like Hilton high school, we competed with Hilton high school. Um, so I probably grew up 20 minutes from, from where he did. And I mean, he's a hundred times the oh wrestler that I could ever, I <laughs> could ever hope to be, but yeah, I'm very, very close to him. In uh, New York, in, in New York, geographically, if, right. if he saw me, he might say, I think I've seen that guy at a practice before. Well, like upstate New York and just New York in general is so freaking tough. And uh, you were a state placer, made the semis. And, you know, when you look back at, at, at all your time going through there, was it you know, the J-Rob camp that was the big turning point for you? Or like, what was it that kind of flipped the switch to really make you love wrestling? Because you are a fanatic, brother. Like, you're crazy about it. Yeah. Yeah, it was my my high school wrestling coach, 100%. Um, his name's John Leone. He was um, uh, NCAA Division III uh, national champion at Brockport State. And, I mean, he, he, he was everything for me. I mean, he the, – the first day of practice in, in – in New York State, you're allowed to wrestle varsity in seventh and eighth grade. And I got, I got pulled up in eighth grade. And I, I wrote it down on a piece of paper before this, actually. The first day of practice, the first thing that he said to the team is – discipline is doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it. And if you want to be a great wrestler, you got to be disciplined. Um, there are so many lessons that he taught me about, about wrestling and life that I lean on to this day, every single day. One of the big things he talked about was he talked to a ton about positive self-talk, right? If you knew how powerful your thoughts were, you would never think a negative thought again. He talked about focus on the process, not the product. Rather, another way they say it might be um, focus on the inputs, the things you can control rather than the outputs. I don't care. I mean, I care, but I don't focus on whether or not I won the match other than from a, all right, let's do some film study and figure out what could I have done differently. I focus on the things that I can control. Everything outside of that is outside of your control. And so worrying about things outside of your control is only a waste of emotional energy that actually pulls you away from, from your, your goal. So. Uh, he was the one that encouraged me to go to the, the J-Rob camp, which is another thing that was like a foundational element for me. I actually, uh, over the holidays, I was back home in Rochester and I have another thing that was a really big, big thing for me, Ryan, was I, I write in a journal every single night. I've been writing in a journal 
two pages every night since I was in sixth grade. And so I actually Dang, had to go back and, and that's read crazy. Through. Yeah, it, it sort of started as like a training journal. Like actually in sixth grade, it started because the girl whose locker next to mine was not interested in being my girlfriend. Shocker. Uh, and so I, you know, I had to get all that teen angst out. Ooh. And then it sort of became a training journal as I went through high school and college. And I still do it now. And it's so, so powerful because what it allows me to do is I reflect on the day just that just happened and I sort of make a game plan for the day that's to come. And one of the things that I try to do is I, I try to identify in the day that just happened in that reflection period, if I could redo the day that just happened, what would I do differently to get a better outcome? And there are mm. so many times that that analysis informs my action the next day. And so you start to create this like accretive improvement process. Um, I, so love, I, three, I love the improvement focus, by the way. I just, yeah. my favorite word is Kaizen and yeah. uh, that's just continuous improvement, but keep going, mm-hmm. keep going. It's so a Japanese tell, word, right? It is. Yeah. I, I learned okay. about it from the Toyota production system. Yes. And uh, it, that is a, that is a wormhole that will take you three weeks away from your friends and family, just learning about how Toyota became this you know, massive car company, but it all kind of ties into this, you know, the modern day concept of DevOps and that's a whole other whatever, but I, that's how I learned about it. I'm like, what's the Toyota production system? I think, I think it's Toyota production system. And then it's like, well, you know, they got so much more efficient and I'm like, well, I, you know, so bottom line is this concept Kaizen and they get it printed on my wall, tattooed, whatever. It's going to be everywhere, but it's like every day, if you can just improve on something, mm-hmm how much better would you be? So you're looking back at your journal and you're thinking, all right, here's what I did, but then what could I have done differently? And then that right. impacts your next day. Right. I mean, it doesn't always, but right. the idea is you want to identify anytime. So I learned this from a book called principles, the Ray Dalio book. One of the things he talks about is anytime you're in a moment of like pain, anytime you're doing something you're like, Oh man, this sucks. Try to find a learning lesson from it because the worst thing that could happen is not the bad thing that happened to you. It's the bad thing happening to you and you losing control of your emotions and getting like frustrated and upset and then not finding a way to avoid that pit hole in the future. And so it actually changes your relationship with adversity. The big thing my, my high school coach, coach Leon said to me was adversity is a good thing. Adversity is a good thing. And so Anytime that you deal with adversity, it's, it makes you tougher. And it also is an opportunity for you to identify the way to avoid that adversity in the future, right? So you can just keep, keep skyrocketing up. And so it changes your relationship with adversity when you frame it as an area to improve that actually makes you better for the future. Because now when I'm dealing with something where it's like, oh, this is horrible. I'm like, okay, how could I avoid this in the future? What's the learning lesson here? And I mean, there's a million, like, like there's so many micro things like, here's sort of a weird one, like the power of habit, like every single morning, my first thing in the morning, I work out in the middle of the day because I feel like it creates, it bisects the day. I almost get two work days. So my morning time, my routine every single day while I have my, my, my coffee, like I empty the dishwasher and I clean the apartment, which seems like <laughs> sort of weird, but it takes me about 25 minutes. I did it this morning, but the act of like bending down and like I'm folding laundry and I'm putting stuff away and I'm emptying the dishwasher, like that physical movement sort of gets me going. And then every day, like the house like it's, it's really, really neat and orderly. And so like, that was something that I learned over time because what I used to do is I would wake up and I would look at this horrible device Ooh, called my cell phone and bad, I'd, bad, I'd literally bad. be laying in bed. And so that was something that I learned over time. Like that was one of those, Hey, my day got like, that was one thing. I don't even know when I identified it. I identified it probably six or seven years ago where I'm like, well, that was a crummy way to start the day. That didn't make me feel good. What could I do differently? Okay, at least just get out of bed and don't look at my phone for the first 20 minutes. And then later I realized, okay, wait, if I'm not looking at my phone, instead of just sitting there drinking my coffee, what if I like emptied the dishwasher? And it became this like personal life routine that now it's just like it's part of my day. And so don't focus on the specific tactic of what I do there, more focus on the It's your life. And if you can identify areas to get more out of it every single day, one, it makes the adversity not as bad. It doesn't pull you as low. Two, you start to create this life for you where I can get more done in a day than I think some people could in a week. And that's not me coming from a place of like hubris. That's me coming from a, like I've consistently worked on getting more juice for my squeeze. Mm -hmm. And I love how you, you have this, this framework and this philosophy and, and, just by looking at your website and just by looking at some of your posts, it seems like you guys don't take yourself too seriously. Cause we know all those people that, you know, are in, I mean, we're self-help 
junkies. You know, all the books you're mentioning, you know, very familiar. And uh, you look at my bookshelf, you think I'm having like a midlife crisis, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, but you can get too into that and you can take yourself so seriously. And I've fallen into those traps. And uh, you know, I, so I try to like my, m- kind of mix my business, the, the, the Tim Ferriss of me with the yep. bar stools because they're having so much fun. And it looks like just by looking at your, your website for your podcast, mm-hmm. Even how you describe the two hosts, you know, it's like uh, it's just funny. You have a sense of uh, not taking yourself too seriously. So is that something that's just natural for you? Is that a conscious effort that you had to to kind of go through? That's something that has has morphed over time because yeah. I think most people have been at those wrestling tournaments where everyone's like mean mugging. You don't smile in the, in the on the podium like I'm I'm tough. And no, that was something that I definitely cultivated in in, in my, through my college wrestling. I would say where it's like yeah. You might as well just say, and it's kind of fun when you let your personality shine on the mat and then in life. And, um, you know, there's, that's, that's a consistent thing to work on. I will tell you externally, I, I, I think I come across as taking myself far less seriously internally. That's an area I need to work on where it's like, it is going to work out. It's going to be okay. It's going like, to work out. Yeah. yeah. You right. know, and like, um, yeah, same way. It's just like something that if not, you're just going through life so serious. And then you come across someone who, Maybe it's just hourly, but you see them like they're doing the things you want to do, but they're also having fun. You're like, man, it's just such a more re- refreshing way to go about it. You know what I mean? Like, good Lord, how, how much, what would you rather do? The, the one where the guy's like taking himself seriously all the time or someone like a barstool cat where they're just, they're getting things done. They're producing a shitload of content, but they're having fun doing it. You know, it's oh. like pretty obvious to me, which one would be, uh, which one would be better. And as we wind down, you know, you're, you're a sales, a salesman, but you know, way more than that. You uh, co-host a podcast that's very popular. And uh, so just tell us a little bit about that, how it started and, you know, why sales and how wrestling has kind of helped you in that area. Yep. So <laughs> I wouldn't have gotten into sales had it not been for my college wrestling team. So my college wrestling training partner for three of my, my four years, his name's Armand Farouk. And Armand and I, like he was the guy that really ran that program with me. My, 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 where my skill set was, was like going out and recruiting people and making sure that like the program was humming really well. He was the guy who I had no idea how to manage a budget. He was the one managing the budget and helping with a lot of the admin stuff. And like he and I were the captains of the team together. Mm-hmm. And when I graduated from college, I, I didn't start in sales. I started working at Aldi, the grocery store. I was a regional manager for Aldi, which was a great job, great company, but after about nine months, I'm like, oh my gosh, like my job is to walk the, you know, the, the halls of the store and make sure everything's clean. And the goldfish are priced at 269, not 249. Cause God forbid we have an error. And I'm like, that's not, that's like those little details. That's not me. And Armand was the one who encouraged me like, dude, you got to get into sales. You'd be so good at it. So he encouraged me to get into sales. And then a couple of years later, I encouraged him because he was like, wow, you're, you're doing really well. So I don't know. I think there's so many sales and wrestling parallels. Oh my God. You get get punched in the face all day, right? Like my job, I make a hundred cold calls and 98 of those people will tell me something rude, um, which I'm cold calling them. Like, like you go, you're like, it's just like taking a shot in a wrestling match. You know, you're probably going to get your head stuff and it's like not going to work out great, but you keep doing it because eventually it will. And so of those 98, you know, one says, yeah, let's meet and then ignores you later. And then one actually does meet with you and that might turn into a sale or it might not. You probably need 10 of those to turn into a sale. So it's the idea like there's this daily rhythm of discipline and hard work that is accretive and adds up very similar to the stuff we talked about earlier. And so like you said, like I'm sort of a self-help junkie, like the, you know, the Kaizen, the improvement thing. And so there was a point in time where I was working at, as an entry level sales job. It was my first ever sales job, and like there was no training, nothing. It was the equivalent of being like, yeah, just show up at wrestling practice, no coach, figure it out, right? And so it was going terribly. I'm like, I have to find a way to get better at this. And so this was, I had just moved um, back to LA after a period of not being there for for the nine months when I was with Aldi, and I was riding my bike every single day to work. I'll I'll show you. I've got a an e-bike right there that I would ride because I did not want to deal with the LA traffic. I would rather ride this e-bike and I would listen to podcasts on the way there. And I started listening to sales podcasts. And most of them, what I found were you would listen for an hour and you would pull out like one to two nuggets that you could use. And the value density was not tremendous. And about two years later, Armand and I both had sort of gotten some footing in the sales space. And 
there's a whole like story around why we would want to start a podcast more than just, oh, you know, let's talk about best practices for sales. But the whole value proposition, like the thesis of the show is if we can make the value density so much that in 30 minutes, somebody can get 12 nuggets that they pull out, that should lead to a very, very successful show. And so the way that we operate the show is we push the guests to only talk about things that they can do, say, or write that very day. Like, but the listeners can go out and steal and grab and use. There's none of this like, oh, you've got to be a hard worker. You've got to, you've got to sell value. Okay. I know those things. Like, I'm what does sorry. That mean? Me, right? yeah. yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything as opposed to when you make a cold call, here's exactly what you should say to start the call, to get the person to at least give you a minute of time. And so we only focus on things people can use. And then what we do is we trim the interview down. We record with guests for about 45 minutes and we cut about 15 minutes of the you can see I can be long-winded sometimes. And so we cut, we like, we cut that stuff. We used to have the show start where Armand would say, Nick, how you feeling today? You ready for a great show? And I would say, I'm feeling awesome. Let's do this thing. And we cut that because it gave no value to the listener. And so, um, yeah, we're very, very like disciplined and rigid from that perspective. Like we only want things that the listener can like go out and use. And what's the show called? It's called 30 minutes to president's club. President's club is like, if you're in the top 1% of salespeople at a company, you get to go on this fancy trip called President's Club. It's awesome. Yeah, no, it's such a great name. And I love the concept of it because when my buddy Tom and I were starting our old podcast, we're like, man, like one, the, the current sales materials either, it's kind of like, like a little stodgy. Like you feel like these guys are wearing suits to meetings still. And you're like, that's just not relevant anymore. But then yeah, some of it's just kind of hokey. And you know, you just, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Don't get me wrong, but so you saw a niche, you went after it and you have this awesome podcast. And now like, I just want to kind of pick your brain on, you know, one of the, one of the things you, uh, one of the pieces of advice you've given, uh, the helpful seller, because I've been this person and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is a wrestling podcast, but we have a lot of business people listening, a lot of salespeople listening. So I just want to wind down with what is the helpful seller and, uh, how do you diagnose this problem? Cause again, I, I fallen into that trap many times. Yeah, I think what most salespeople think is that they've got to have this like uber over the top friendly customer says, send me some information. Oh, absolutely. I'm on top of it. I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to write like the best perfect sales email and send it to them. And you always want to be respectful. You always want to be professional, but your job as a salesperson isn't to be an order taker. And your job as a salesperson isn't to be like a yes man or yes woman. Your job is to help the customer solve their problem and sell something on behalf of your organization. And so it's okay to like push back a little bit. If somebody says, yeah, can you send me like, okay, you make a cold call. They say, yeah, sounds sort of interesting. Can you send me an email? Your first response is, yep, absolutely. Let me go do that. I'm going to be so helpful and send them an email. It's like, I'm happy to do that. Can you let me know what you'd like to see in the email? Right? Like you're always like there's sort of a give forget thing. There's this rule of reciprocity. If somebody asks you for something, you then have the right to ask back. And it helps you from wasting your time because as most salespeople know, if you make a cold call and they say, send me an email, eight times out of 10, that means I'm not interested and I'm just being polite and telling you to go away. And you can call that out even. There have been times someone will say, yeah, yeah, send me an email and say, hey, Ryan, can I ask you sort of a weird question? And they're like, okay. Sometimes when I cold call somebody and they say, send me an email, it's it's really just their way of saying, hey, I'm not interested, but I'm too polite to tell you. Is that what might be happening here? And you, you wouldn't believe the number of people that are like, yeah, You'll I'm say not that. Interested. You'll say that. Yeah, you have to be willing to. And it's like, you're friendly, you're professional. I'm not being aggressive there, but you're coming at it from a perspective of like, like, I don't want to waste my time. Yeah. I don't want to waste my, I don't want to clog up your inbox. See, that's another one where it's like, hey, I, I don't want to clog up your inbox if this is something that like, you're just going to hit archive on. I guess, what would you like to see in that email? Because if it is something legitimate, like I want to make sure that I'm sending, a, what you want to do is allocate your effort towards the things that are actually going to be meaningful, not the, yeah, you know, the guy who sort of just brushed you off. So yeah, it's, a, it's a whole persona. You're, you, you can be professional and respectful, but you don't need to be somebody who just bends over like that. I love it. I love it. And for anyone listening who's not in sales, listen, anyone can do this job. Your first year, and a half probably is going to be horrible, but you can make the best of it. But once you're through that, you can make a great living and it's a fun gig. I always tell people, salespeople are like the athletes of the business world. Everyone at the company is there to help you. Like that's it. Like you, it's just, it's awesome. And so if you're listening, you hate your job and you just want to have 
you know, the potential to earn more, to have more freedom in your life, please consider sales. Uh, I know Nick would echo the same thoughts. Yep. Last question, Nick, as we wind down, my friend, I didn't get the chance to ask you about the supplemental business, which I was just dying to because you're at USC, super strong academic school. You're coaching wrestling, you're wrestling, you're running a business. Mm -hmm. And normally we wind down with how did wrestling change your life? But I just want to ask you, what did running a business in college change or impact about your life that you're still using now? It exposed me to how much more I had to learn and how much better I needed to get. And I think a lot of people, when they leave academics, when they leave school, it's like, all right, I'm done with the learning phase of my life. And now on to the making money phase of my life. And what that revealed to me was if I stopped getting better, that I was going to be stuck at a very certain level. And I think what it re like, cause that what, it wasn't a successful business. Like it was in the beginning. And then we didn't know how to take it to the next level. We didn't know how to get it from four vending machines, which is what we finished at to, it was a vending machine supplement business to four to 40 to 400. We had no idea how to make those jumps. And with what I have learned now, I know I could go back and make those jumps, but that's only because the past eight years have been, all right, like I need to figure out how to get a little bit better every day. So what it really did was it was sort of a humbling experience of like, one, I saw the possibility. And so it opened my eyes to if I put the work in over the next decade, I know that there is a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow available to me, but only if I put the work in. Right. Last thing that I'll leave you, my, 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 my high school coach always told me, he said, failure is temporary if you choose to make it so. It's a very active thing. You can, you can let failure be failure or you can like find a way to work through it, which is okay, we failed in that business. But in my mind, that was a temporary failure because of what has now come. And was there any other nuggets on that sheet that you wanted to get to that we haven't talked through yet? Uh, I, sheet. Let's see. Um, yeah, the biggest one that I wrote is um, it's attitude is more important than facts. Your attitude is more important than your circumstances. The way that you perceive things is much more important than how they actually are. I the love piece that. piece about adversity earlier, right? If, if, if I'm like, man, this is horrible. This like whatever, whatever situation you're in, you can make it worse by bringing yourself down and letting it bring you down, or you can make it better by saying, this is a learning opportunity. This is going to make me tougher. Fantastic. Nick, you are, you are the man, a, a real true wordsmith. And I, I enjoyed this conversation. I look forward to the friendship and uh, yeah, man, just have a great day. Thank you again for coming on the show, brother. Thanks for having me, Ryan. I appreciate it. The Spartan nationals are coming to Jacksonville, Florida, April 8th through the 10th. Wrestle freestyle, folk style, Greco, and beach at the Spartan Nationals. Register now at SpartanCombat.com. That's SpartanCombat.com.